Well, today, as you can see, and as Abby brought up, we will be discussing Solomon's conclusion. And I call it Solomon's conclusion because the, the message will be all about what, what he has for us. What was his conclusion about life? What was his conclusion about God? You see, Solomon, if you know anything about Solomon, you probably know that he was the wisest man who ever lived. And that's not just an opinion. The Bible says there has never been any as wise as Solomon, nor will there ever be any as wise again. And so, what I want us to see then is what can we learn? If God gave him such wisdom, if God gave him such insight, what does he have to teach you and I? And so what we're going to do is we're going to kind of do a brief case study of Solomon's life. What it has to teach us. And then I want us to just pay attention to the application for us today. Let's begin in 1 Kings. In 1 Kings 4, we'll start with just the, the overwhelming nature of Solomon's wisdom. In 1 Kings 4, beginning in verse 29. And it begins in verse 29, God gave Solomon great wisdom and understanding and knowledge too vast to be measured. In fact, his wisdom exceeded that of all the wise men of the East and all the wise men of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite and Haman and Kalkal and Darda, the sons of Mahal. His fame spread throughout the surrounding nations. He composed some 3,000 proverbs and 1,005 songs. He could speak with authority about all kinds of plants from the great cedars of Lebanon to the tiny hyssops that grow along the cracks in the wall. He could also speak about the animals, the birds, and the reptiles. And kings from every nation sent their ambassadors to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. This guy was no dummy. He could speak with authority on all matters. And the two points out from the plants to the animals. He gave, God gave him wisdom beyond and it named a bunch of people, Ethan the Ezraelite and the sons of Mahal. Now those names probably don't mean much to you, but understand they were noted wise men at the time. They may have even been the king's advisors at the time and the Bible is making a point to say Solomon was wiser than even them. In fact, just how wise he was, it says the other nation sent ambassadors to talk with him. Ambassadors to glean his wisdom. Now this was a very rare occurrence because for kings of other nations to send ambassadors to Solomon, they're, they're noting Solomon is to be superior. And yet Solomon's wisdom was so powerful that they humbled themselves and said, we've got to learn from Solomon. We've got to see what Solomon has to say. Now we have to answer a question, why does Solomon have this wisdom? It's beyond anything humans have. It's beyond anything any normal human would have. And of course, if you know the story, it's because God gave it to him. If you just go back one chapter in 1 Kings 3, beginning in verse 3, it talks about how God gave Solomon profound wisdom. And it says in verse 3, Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the instructions of his father David except that Solomon too offered sacrifices and burnt incense at the local altars. Now this was kind of Solomon's one black mark. He, he loved God wholeheartedly, yes, but there were still some pagan sacrifices. Now Solomon kind of made a compromise with the people. They didn't sacrifice to pagans, but they sacrificed to the living God on pagan altars, which was the, a no-no. But it was the one thing that, that Solomon did that the God's like, that's not so well. But it says the most important of these altars was at Gideon. So the king went there and sacrificed a thousand bulls. That night the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream and God said, What do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. Could you imagine the living God coming to you and I and saying, What do you want? Ask me for anything and I'll give it to you. Well, what would we ask for? I mean, Solomon could ask for riches. You could have asked for riches. Solomon's king. He could have asked to be king of the world. He could, have be, he could have asked for all the other nations to submit to him. But instead, look what, look what Solomon asked for. In verse 6. It says, 
You are you were wonderfully kind to my father David because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued this kindness to him today by giving him a son to succeed him. Oh Lord, my God, now you have made me king instead of my father David. But I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And I am here among your own people. A nation or uh, among your own chosen people. A nation so great that they are too numerous to count. Verse 9, give me understanding so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by myself is able to, or who but himself is able to govern the great nation of yours. And then in verse 10, Solomon continues and says, or Lord, the Lord continues, he said, the Lord was pleased with Solomon's reply and was glad that he asked for wisdom. And so God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing your people and have not asked for a long life or for riches for yourself or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you've asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding mind so that no one else has, no one else has ever had or ever will have. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and honor. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow and obey my commandments as your father David did, I will give you a long life. So God blesses Solomon. He says, yes, I'll give you the wisdom you've asked for. But I'll also give you fame and fortune. I will make you a king like no other. And all of these blessings, you've got to understand, all of these blessings came with one condition in verse 14. If you follow me and obey my commands as your father David did, I will give you a long life. You see, the way to have the long life, the way to have a fulfilling life, is by following God. The world today has so many ideas and people are searching for how to have the best life possible and I promise you it is by following God. Solomon's story reveals this. As you know, Solomon did not always follow God. And it might seem crazy for you and I to think about it. I mean, Solomon was so blessed by God. Solomon talked with the living God. God gave him so many blessings. It seems ridiculous that he would turn back from God. Because God has blessed him so much. Of course, he would spend his days serving the one who blessed him, right? But the Bible reveals the most dangerous time in our Christian walk is when we have everything we want. When we have everything we need. That is when the Bible says you must watch out. Because it is in our times of greatest blessings that we run the greatest risk of forgetting God. And it says this. Keep your, keep your hand in 1 Kings, but if you turn to Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 8, it says this very same truth. In fact, it was Moses warning the people of Israel not to disobey God. Deuteronomy 8, beginning in verse 11, Moses says, but that is the time you must be careful. Beware that in your plenty you do not forget the Lord your God or disobey Him. For when you have become full and prosperous and have built homes to live in, when your flocks and your herds have become very large and your silver and your gold have multiplied along with everything else. That is the time you must be careful. Do not become proud at this time and forget it was the Lord your God who rescued you from slavery in the land of Egypt. Do not forget it was Him who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness with the poisonous snakes and the scorpions. Where it was so dry and hot that he's the one who gave you the rock, water from the rock. He fed you with manna in the wilderness. A food unknown to your ancestors. He did this to humble you and to test you for your own good. He did it so you would never think that it was by your own strength and energy that you had made your wealth. Always remember... Always remember that it was the Lord your God who gave you the power to become rich. He did this to fulfill the covenant He made with your ancestors. 
Verse 19, but I assure you of this, if you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods, worshiping and bowing down to them, you will certainly be destroyed. Just as the Lord your God destroyed other nations, you will also be destroyed for not obeying God. Now these were solemn words to the people of Israel. God is saying, follow me. Don't forget me. And the application here is in our times of plenty, this is when we run the risk of forgetting God. I mean, just, just think about it personally. When, when we're struggling, when we don't know how we're going to make it to tomorrow, when we are just at the end of our rope, what do we do? We pray to God. We depend on Him. Because without Him, we don't know how we're going to make it forward. But in times where it's good, in times where we have everything we need, are we still praying as faithfully? Or do we say, I got it, I can figure it out. You see, God is just as important in our times of plenty as He is in our times of nothing. And Solomon's story reveals this. You see, Solomon accumulated a vast amount of wealth. Probably one of the wealthiest men who ever lived. But in that time of plenty, Solomon forgot God. In fact, we notice that in, in 1 Kings, if you go to, go to chapter 10, in verse 14, that there's a, a time in Solomon's life where he begins to collect tributes from all the other nations. And it says in verse 14 of chapter 10, it says, Each year Solomon received about 25 tons of gold. And we notice that after this point in Solomon's life, if you were to keep reading, Solomon becomes more and more dark and confused. He becomes more and more turned off from God. Now, it's interesting to note that they didn't measure in tons back in the Bible times. That's a modern measurement, obviously. But 25 tons, the, the, the unit they used to measure in the Bible times is talents. And 25 tons works out to be exactly 666 talents, according to their membership, or according to their measurements. That's 666. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that that's what is known as the mark of the beast in Revelation, the one that you'll get on your forehead or your arm. Now, I'm not saying Solomon received the mark of the beast, and I'm not saying the number 666 has any power in of itself, but that number is, Satan has used that number to represent himself. And so the fact that the Bible says that Solomon receives this, it is showing that Solomon is getting further from God and more and more entrenched in the world. Further from God and closer to Satan. Because after this point in his life, he begins to accumulate all this wealth and all this power. And all of his wives and all of these work against him. And he turns from God. Now what baffles me about the story of Solomon, what I just can't wrap my head around, is one of the rules of a king, one of the things you did as a king, the first thing you did when you were a king of Israel, is you wrote out the law. In front of the Levitical priest, you wrote a copy of the first five books of the Bible, the Torah. And you had to write it out painstakingly day and night until you finished it. And once you finished it, you had to go back over it again and again and again, as the Bible says, so that you would not forget the laws of the Lord. Now Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. Surely memorizing these laws would have been easy for him. Surely having understanding of these laws would have been easy for him. But let's just read one of the laws. Keep your finger in 1 Kings, if you have your Bible open, and, and go to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 17. Let's just read one of the laws that Solomon would have had to write, to memorize, to go over and over again. In Deuteronomy 17, beginning in verse 16, and it's talking about the laws to regulate a king. And it says in verse 16, the king must not build up large stables for horses for himself, and he must never send his people to Egypt to buy horses, for the Lord has said you may never return to Egypt. Now, of course, you and I are probably reading this, why does God hate horses out of all things? But you have to understand, back in Israel's time, wars were often won or lost by the amount of horses the enemy had or you had. In fact, you can even read in the Bible when some of the armies are attacking Israel, the oft, often the thing that's commented is their vast armies of chariots. So, I, it's not, we're not really told why he told his people not to accumulate horses. I personally believe it is because he wanted the people of Israel to know their victory does not come from horses, but from the Almighty. 
You see, if, if Israel had a lot of horses and they won the battle, Israel could say, our cavalry has won the war. But if Israel had next to nothing when it came to horses, these essential equipment for, our, for warfare, and they still won, then they could say well, it had to be the Almighty. He's the one who did it. So Solomon reads this law, and guess what's one of the first things he does as soon as he gets his power and his wealth? He begins to build stables and accumulate a large amount of horses. Furthermore, in verse 17, it says, The king must not take for himself many wives, because they will lead him away from the Lord. And he must not accumulate vast amounts of wealth in silver and gold. We already know right away, Solomon's accumulating a vast amount of wealth of silver and gold. But then the Bible says that the king must not take many wives. Do you want to know who is on record as having the biggest amount of wives of any of the kings of Israel? King Solomon. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. Now understand that the concubines, they were still technically wives. They just were not of high stature as the wives. So maybe the wives all had royal blood and the concubines, they probably weren't of royal blood. So they weren't a wife, they were a concubine. They were still all part of his harem or his wives. A thousand wives! And the Bible warns against it because he's, they, the Bible says that if you have these many wives, they will turn your heart from God. And maybe Solomon in his wisdom is thinking, I'm wise, I know better. Maybe he's thinking he's so wise that he knows better than God. But guess what happened when Solomon had all those wives? They turned his heart from God. And you can see this if you go to 1 Kings, uh, just one chapter ahead of where we were at in 1 Kings 11. The first three verses. Now Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, from Ammon, from Edom, from Sidon, and from among the Hittites. The Lord had clearly instructed his people not to intermarry with those nations because the women they married would lead them to worship other gods. And I like how this ends. Yet Solomon insisted on marrying them. Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. You know, I actually had a, a, a lay instructor when I was a lay leader. They were, uh, we were going over uh, getting my lay certification and everything. And the lay instructor had come to, they were talking to the class and they said, our son is considering marrying an unbeliever. They said, and they, they, they literally said this, just what Solomon said. They said, we know what the Bible says about it. But we talked to God, and God said it was okay. Just like Solomon. I know what God says, yet I love them anyway. You see, the reason the Bible emphasizes the fact that Christians should only marry Christians, that you and I should only be with other Christians, is because we will not change them. They will change us. As they did Solomon. In verse 3, it says, He had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and sure enough, they led his heart away from the Lord. You know, if there's one thing I could ask Solomon, it would be why. What is the point to having a thousand different wives? I got to tell you, I've had a hard enough time finding one. And once I find one, I'm not going to be looking for any more. And Solomon had 700. He's like, I think I want more concubines. And they did just what the God said they would. They turned his heart away. What is very interesting to me is when Solomon has his heart turned from God, he instantly goes from being the wisest man to just an utter fool. And you can see the darkness in his mind. All of his wisdom doesn't help at all when he has rejected the living God. In fact, in, in kind of his, his haze, and kind of his rejection of God, he pens a book that we read in the Bible. Uh, sometimes people avoid this book because they say it's kind of depressing, which it can be. But the book of Ecclesiastes is, is kind of what we're focused in for the rest of our time together. And in this book he writes, we're not sure when he wrote it, but we know he wrote it later in life. And this book is really, if you, if you look at it and read it, it's really him trying to reach out, him trying to find meaning in, the, in life. In fact, I think I've, one of the best descriptions of this book that I've heard is it is a dark study of a man against God. I think that's a pretty good description because a lot of the stuff in here seems very anti-Christian. And so you've got to understand, what, what, what Solomon is saying is not the words of a saved man, but the words of a lost man who's trying to reach out for something, who's trying to find some meaning in all of this. 
And the way that we know he's against God is the phrase that keeps appearing in Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes keeps having the phrase under the sun. If you ever read the book, it's always under the sun, under the sun, under the sun. That phrase quite literally means everything apart from God. Because under the sun, that's us down here, the sun up in heaven, us down here, and then God is above the sun in heaven. So under the sun is everything apart from God. And so what Saul is, Solomon's trying to do is what so many people in the world are trying to do. They're trying, he's trying to answer the question, what is the meaning of life? And so I just want to read to you, I and mean, we're not going to read the whole book due to time, but I just want to read to you a few of the highlights from this book to see what his great conclusion is. And he begins in verse, or let's begin in verse 2 of Ecclesiastes 1. Everything is meaningless. Or other translations say vanities upon vanities. Understand the, the vanities in the Hebrew, we think of vanity today as being, being vain. The vanity in Hebrews means nothing, means meaningless. The, the literal translation is a breeze or a wind or nothingness. And so, the, 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 it goes, everything is meaningless, says the preacher. Now, he calls himself the preacher in Ecclesiastes. In fact, Ecclesiastes is just the Hebrew word for preacher. And so, he's the preacher in Ecclesiastes, and the preacher is telling us everything is meaningless, utter meaningless. Verse 3, what, is the, what do people get from all their hard work? He's as if, as if he's saying, what is the point? What is the point of waking up, of struggling throughout the day? Of going to bed and doing it all over again. What is the point of everything? And his conclusion is, it is meaningless. You see, Solomon, apart from God, was trying to reach out and find meaning in this crazy world. And he was coming up empty-handed. Now, we're not sure when he wrote Ecclesiastes, other than I, I, we know it was later in his life. I often picture a very aged Solomon trying to put in his final thoughts before he passes. Maybe he knows his time is short, and so he's trying to, to make a, a passionate plea to the people to give them his final account on life. And his final account begins with everything is meaningless. And then he goes through and gives a couple of examples. In verse 12, he says, I, the teacher, was king of Israel, and I lived in Jerusalem. Verse 13, I devoted myself to wisdom, everything being done in the world. And I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. So the wisest man in the world says, wisdom is futile. Wisdom does nothing but show that God has dealt us a tragic existence. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, he says, I said to myself, come now, let's give pleasure a try. Let's look for the good things in life. But I found that this too was meaningless. One of the biggest ways that people try to find meaning in life today apart from God is in pleasure. And Solomon is saying it is meaningless. If you try to find meaning in life in pleasure, I promise you, you will never be satisfied. Because your sinful nature will never be satisfied. It might lie to you and say, hey, do this and you'll be satisfied. Do this and you'll be satisfied. But I promise you that in the end, your sinful nature will continually be ravenous and will continually want more and more and more. The people who try to live their lives for pleasure alone never end up satisfied and happy. They end up always wanting more. As Solomon says, pleasure is meaningless apart from God. The struggle for meaning is on the hearts and minds of almost everyone today. They want to know what the point is. They want to know what their meaning is. We are living in a world today that is having an identity crisis. People don't know what their lives are worth. They don't know that their lives have value. They don't know that their lives have meaning. And so they are turning to drugs and other sources to find that meaning, to find that relief. Because the world today would have you believe that you are not special. But you are an accident. That you came by chance. And that you are nothing more than the most highly evolved animal. And there is no meaning in that. The problem with those who reject God is they cannot answer the meaning of life. 
They might think that they can, but if you ask, and, and I'm not saying that, that you know, you need God to be a good person. There are many moral, uh, as you call, they call themselves moral atheists out there. Yeah, they do good. They, they, they try to live the best life possible. But they can't answer why they ought to do that. They can't answer why it's better to be good than it is to be bad. Why it's better to serve others than to serve yourself. Because again, apart from God, life has no real meaning. And this is what Ecclesiastes is all about. Solomon goes through again and again saying everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. And then he gets to the to kind of the point in 9, in chapter 9, where he talks about, I think, one of the most dangerous beliefs that exist today. In chapter 9, he talks about how there is no afterlife. Now understand, when, the, when he's saying there is no afterlife, he's not saying this as a saved man, but as a man who is completely lost. And he says in the first seven verses, this too I carefully explored. Notice over and over again Solomon saying, I've explored this, I've carefully looked into this. And he's saying, even though the actions of the godly and the wise people are in God's hands, no one knows whether or not God will show them favor in life. The same destiny ultimately awaits everyone. Whether they are righteous or wicked, good or bad, ceremonially clean or unclean, religious or irreligious, good people receive the same treatment as sinners and the people who take oath are treated as those who do not. Verse 3, it seems tragic that one's fate, that one fate comes to all. That is why people are not more careful about being good. Instead, they choose their own mad course, for they have no hope. We are living in a world today without hope. And it says, there is nothing ahead but death anyway. The hope is for the living. For as they say, and so Solomon's writing this as if it's a common saying around the, uh, during his day. For as they say, it's better to be a live dog than a dead lion. We don't say that much today, but apparently it was a saying around Solomon's day. And in verse 5, he says, The living at least know they're going to die, but the dead know nothing. They have no further reward, nor are they remembered. Whatever they do in life, loving, hating, or envying, is long gone. They are no longer a part of anything here on earth. And so his conclusion, so go ahead. Eat your food and drink your wine with a happy heart. For God approves this. Wear fine clothes with a dash of cologne. You see, the problem that Solomon is bringing up is if people believe all there is is here and now, they will live their life in whatever way they want. If People believe that all there is is here now and there is no answer for sin, that there is no answer for their actions, that they don't have to give an account, then what stops them from doing whatever evil things they want to do? Many of the most evil things that we have seen in the world are simply people who are trying to satisfy their sinful nature because they don't believe there's an afterlife. So I ask you today... As we're going to look at in just a minute, is what is Solomon's conclusion? Is there a God? Is there a life after death? Is life meaningless? Are we nothing more than the most highly evolved animal? If there is a God, does he care about you? And the final question is what is the point to life under the sun? I think one of the most powerful aspects of Solomon's story is the ending. Solomon ends Ecclesiastes with a very, very powerful testimony. In fact, a testimony so powerful that many people like me will fully believe we will see him in heaven. After looking at everything, after exploring everything under the sun, Solomon brings us this final conclusion to wrap up life itself. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. He says, here is my final conclusion. As if telling everyone, I have done everything. I have looked all over. I have tried everything. 
And I have come to this one conclusion. As if pleading with the people who read this, don't be like me. Don't try to search for meaning elsewhere because you will find no meaning elsewhere. He says, here is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commands. For this is the duty of every person. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. Fear God and obey His commands. What a powerful conclusion for Solomon. And what a perfect conclusion for you and I. And in fact, we can take the story even further. For Solomon says, God will judge every, us for everything we do. And you and I can, can say, as Paul says in Romans 8.1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, where Solomon says, God will judge us, we can say there is somebody who already took our judgment. Where Solomon says, as he does, that every secret thing will be revealed, whether good or bad, you, we can say there is somebody who has already answered for everything we have done on the cross, and that is Jesus. You see, the truth of the Bible is that you are not an accident, but you were made perfect by God. The truth of the Scriptures are that God created you just as He wanted you to be. God placed you here for a specific reason. He could have placed you anywhere over the earth and any time throughout history, and yet he says, I want your expelled church here for such a time as this, as, he, as it says in Esther. What I love best about the Bible is it reveals the great love of God for us, and it reveals the purpose for our lives, and that purpose is to serve the Lord. You see, the world would teach that, that, that we are... Again, nothing more than, than random events that happened together and worked out so perfectly to create us. But the Bible teaches that you were made special to God. In fact, if you look at the creation story, the thing you'll see very commonly restated is the Bible says God says and it's done. God says and it's done. Let there be light and it's light. Let there be uh, the vegetation spring forth and the vegetation will spring forth. But when it came to creating you and I, when it came to creating people, He didn't just speak and it was done. It's much more personal than that. In fact, he said, let us go down. Let us leave the heavens and go down and mold them out of the dust of the ground. Mold their delicate features just the way I want them. And then let us breathe the breath of life in them. And now the breath you and I breathe is the breath of God. The world today is in a desperate search for meaning. The meaning of life. And they try everything as Solomon did. They try everything. And I promise you they're coming up empty handed. But you and I have the meaning. It is found in the scriptures. It is found in serving the Lord. And so for, for those of us who know our meaning. For those of us who know our purpose. Then we ought to be helping other people find it. We weren't given this great gift so that we could hoard it for ourselves. We were given it so that we could share it with all who would listen. The purpose of life, as Solomon concludes it, fear God and serve Him, obey Him. Solomon wraps up, and I like that the, there's a quote that I was reading in, in regards to Ecclesiastes. I'm not sure who quoted it, but he says, The only way to find meaning in life under the sun is to look to the God who is beyond life under the sun. God Himself, the living God. And so since we have found our identity in Him, it is our duty to help others find their identity in Him. That is what the world is in desperate need of. People need to know their worth. They need to know that they are loved, that they are cared for, that there is a God who created them for a specific purpose in life. And so may we be the ones to tell them. May we bring them Solomon's conclusion to fear the Lord and to serve Him. For that is the way to a long life. Let us bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come before You today. Lord, knowing that You are who gives us meaning. Lord, that the reason that we are here is because of You, because of what You have done for us. Lord, may we spend every day serving you. May we spend every day helping, Lord, helping reach others who need that purpose, who need that meaning. Lord, may you use us 
And Lord, like Solomon, may we come to the conclusion that we ought to serve the Lord. Lord, there is nothing else in this world that is worth it. There's nothing else in the world that we can find value or meaning in except from you, Lord. So may we seek only you. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone in agreement say, Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn for today is In Christ Alone. And it's in the green hymnal or up on the screen. Please stand as you are able. deep love of God that sends Christ upon the cross for our sins is the only love, the only one that we can find meaning in. So my conclusion for you is the same as Solomon's conclusion. That you would fear the Lord and that you would serve Him. And that you would help others to do the same. Amen.